Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. We're most pleased to welcome you back to our long series that we're doing on the topic, Hot Talk, Passionate Debate for New Age. And over a two-week period during this process, we usually have a subtopic for two weeks, a pro and a con. Last week, uh, Praveen Fernandez was here to support same-sex marriages. This week, our guest is here to oppose same-sex marriages, so you've heard both sides. Our guest is Dwight G. Duncan, is a, and he is a professor at the Southern New England School of Law. He is a leading conservative authority on bioethics, legal ethics, and constitutional law and has been involved in the ongoing legal debate over gay marriages. In fact, our distinguished guest is the principal co-author of the United States Supreme Court brief on the prevailing side of the Supreme Court case called Hurley versus Irish American Gay, Lesbian, and Bisexual Organization in 1995, where the court ruled that forcing a veterans group to include a gay contingent in their annual St. Patrick's Day parade was a violation of their First Amendment right. Our guest holds a bachelor's degree in Greek and Latin from Harvard University, and he holds a doctor of jurisprudence from Georgetown University Law Center, and he also has a doctorate in canon law from the University of the Holy Cross in Rome, Italy. Uh, Professor Duncan, thank you for being with us. You've been generous with your time in uh, speaking at our college and also being on our program. Well, thank you for having me, Tony. It's been great. It's been wonderful. And I'm very pleased to welcome our regular panelist, Janelle Burke, who's an attorney in the state of Idaho, and she will commence today's question with our guest. Professor Duncan, it's a pleasure to have you here. I Thank want you. to start the program by sort of laying some foundation. Define the issues that surround the same-sex marriage, and can you define also for us what is same-sex marriage? How does it differ from civil unions? How does it differ, differ from certain partnerships and so forth? Can you sort of address those issues for our yeah, audience? Yeah, um, at, at some level, I think the uh, same-sex marriage debate is something that in the United States has um, been uh, addressed really through the courts. That is, there's been a concerted uh, attempt on the part of gay advocacy organizations like Human Rights Campaign or the Gay Lesbian Advocates and Defenders to basically advance the project of same-sex marriage through the courts. That is, and, and it's been a project advanced through state courts rather than the federal courts. The reason for that is that there's no federal court that I'm aware of that has ever held that the federal constitution requires the legal recognition of same-sex marriage. In fact, all the federal court decisions at whatever level have all been on the other side of that issue. So, thus the strategy was I think, to advance this project through state courts using state constitutional provisions. And really, this has been about a 10-year campaign that began in Hawaii in 1996, and their state Supreme Court was very close to saying that the Hawaii Constitution required the recognition of same-sex marriage. But then what happened is the, the people submitted this to a referendum, and the people passed a constitutional amendment, state constitutional amendment, by overwhelming majorities uh, in Hawaii. And basically, this, this project has proceeded from state to state, uh, never quite succeeding, although they came close to succeeding in, Ver in the state of Vermont, where the state Supreme Court in Vermont said that basically the legislature had to grant same-sex couples either marriage or some other equivalent legal status by another name, which they said was civil unions that would grant all the legal rights, benefits, and responsibilities of marriage under state law. Okay. So it advanced that far in Vermont. Then they went to Massachusetts and filed suit there. I got involved in the other, on the other side, really, defending marriage, as I had in, in Hawaii and Vermont. The point is they succeeded in Massachusetts when they got, on November 18th of 2003, a decision from our state Supreme Court, the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, which decided by a vote of four to three that our state constitution, which had been written by John Adams in 1780, uh, actually required that we recognize same-sex marriage. So it took really 200 and almost 225 years to recognize that our state constitution required uh, same-sex marriage. And I guess I'm skeptical 
of this project in the sense that, well, it succeeded by one vote in Massachusetts, four to three decision of the judiciary, which basically means one judge is deciding this question for our entire state and arguably for the nation, actually, because of, of other considerations. But, and I guess the question, I guess my, my main concern, or, or one of my principal concerns about this whole debate is, is this a question to be, you know, th this question about the nature and meaning of marriage, is this a question that should be decided by an un unelected, largely unelected judiciary, or is it ultimately a question that should be decided by the people? And I guess I would argue, along with John Adams, who wrote our state constitution and was one of the co-authors of the Declaration of Independence, really, and, and it's explicit in our state constitution, it says basically that all power derives from the people and that all powers of government, including the judiciary, are accountable to the people. What's interesting about this debate is every place that this has been put to a vote, where it's been allowed to be put on the ballot, the people, uh, my side, that, that want to have marriage as it's always been understood to be, you know, for millennia, uh, that marriage is between a man and a woman, they have prevailed, and by wide margins, so that since the Massachusetts decision came into force, there have been 13 states that have voted on this, and all 13 decided that marriage is what it always been, has been understood to be, by overwhelming majorities, many of them amending their state constitutions, all 11 states that was on the ballot in November passed the state constitutional amendment or statute saying marriage was only between a man and a woman. So I guess one of my concerns about this whole debate is, and I think it's great you're having this program because I think it's important that people get involved in this issue and understand what's happening because otherwise this issue is going to be decided by a small group of elites who will essentially be imposing their value preferences on the rest of us. And it's like, you know, it's a little bit, of, it, these controversial social issues like this or abortion, you know, there's a, a sense in which politicians hate to have to deal with these issues because they are controversial and they would love to duck it, basically. They would love to say, let the courts decide, you know, I don't really want to get involved because they know that who, whatever side they come down upon, they're going to get somebody upset. And, and, and I'm saying I, I, that's, not a, that's not a healthy trend in a democracy, I don't think, where all the basic fundamental questions are decided by some small group of, you know, some, some small elite group. I mean, I think that's what the American Revolution was all about, actually. Uh, you know, one thing we like to do on the program is play the devil's advocate, too. And, I, and, and Please. You, you're, <laughs> as a law professor, you're very good at this and you, you understand the process. Uh, let, let's take your arguments you've had and, and, and sure. ask you to defend it from another perspective. If you look at our history of our evolution of our democracy, it's a, it's, it's a great democracy, but part of that evolution has been through change. Uh, mm -hmm. We got rid of slavery, uh, right. and then we got rid of uh, the legalization, the segregation, the role mm -hmm. of women. Women have the right to vote. Some of those rights uh, have been won through amendments to the Constitution, such as the women's right to vote in 1920. Mm -hmm. But also, a lot of the progress that's been made in relation to expanding the people's rights from a legal perspective uh, have come through court decisions, a lot of them five to four. Mm -hmm. And so both in state court and the U.S. Supreme Court, would you take the position that when we're dealing with issues where people are asking for recognition, and, and if we didn't get away from same-sex marriage, talk about housing or jobs, mm -hmm. whatever it is, isn't there a time when there's a role for the court to be the one to interpret the Constitution rather than a vote. For example, your opposition that was here last week pointed Loving v. Virginia, and when the court said in the 14th Amendment that states could no longer deny interracial marriages, if it had been taken to a vote of the people in the states, they would have kept uh, in, um, the prohibition on interracial marriage. So where do we draw the line right. in when the court should intervene? In other words, are there things yeah, I, that people I, don't have a right to vote on, but right. uh, that, that's constitutional well, there are right? Some, there are cer certain matters that are constitutional rights that are reserved to the courts. I would say that those matters that are clearly spelled out in the Constitution or by fair implication of the Constitution, those are properly decided by courts. And I think the Loving v. Virginia case that you mentioned, which essentially declared that laws against racial intermarriage violated the federal constitution actually were correct, correctly decided under a federal constitution because the whole purpose of the 14th Amendment 
was to outlaw racial discrimination by government, and I think the ban on interracial marriage was just such a, such a thing. However, when we're talking about this project, or for that matter, something like the right to abortion, I honestly think the Constitution is not fairly read to really say anything about this. That, that is, there is no, the word marriage doesn't appear in our federal constitution. It doesn't appear in most state constitutions, right? I, I think the assumption was, at the time that these constitutions were enacted, that marriage is what it always has been. But I'm saying, I don't think you can use some constitutional principle to radically redefine marriage into something other than what it's always been understood to be. And, and, and by the way, this is no sort of narrow, crabbed, understanding of marriage as, you know, as if just some very small segment of the human race has this view of marriage. This is true across millennia, across wide geographic and religious and cultural divides. We've all had this shared understanding of marriage. It is true that now we have, you know, since 19, uh, 2001 with the Netherlands, we now have a small handful of countries and this, you know, the, the People's Republic of Massachusetts that, that basically think that marriage, you know, should be something completely different. And, and I'm just saying, but that is a very, very recent minority view of humankind. And I just think when we're dealing, you know, Loving versus Virginia, while it said we've got to have interracial marriage, and some states didn't like that at the time or whatever, some people didn't like that at the time, nonetheless, it wasn't an argument over what the essence of marriage is, right? That is, interracial marriage was a marriage between a man and a woman. It was capable of procreating children. It was capable of providing children with a mother and a father. And, and, and same-sex marriage, you know, is, is capable of neither, actually. It's not capable of procreating children, and it's not capable of providing children with a mother and a father. And that's true. That's just true. I mean, it's, it's true across the board, and it has really nothing, this argument that I'm making has actually nothing to do with, I don't know, whether or not this same-sex couple is a loving couple or whether or not they care for the children that they may have adopted or have, you know, whatever. I think they, most of them probably want you know, what is best for their children and, you know, are doing the best they can with the situation. I just think the structure is not, a, is not the ideal, optimal structure for raising children. And you've made it clear in your presentation today that you're not advocating any form of discrimination against gay couples. It's just the issue of marriage that, in other words, in housing. No, that's jobs. right. I mean, I, I think gay, gay, gays and lesbians or whatever, whatever one's sexual orientation, one isn't a human being entitled to, you know, dignity and respect and you know, I, I don't think people should be, for example, I don't think people should be fired for their sexual orientation if it has nothing to do with how they perform their job. Uh, you know, so I, I, it really has nothing to do with that. I don't think it has to do with how do we understand marriage. I think one of the unfortunate things about the gay marriage debate is basically the, the debate is, 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 is framed by the proponents really in terms of what will this do for us, you know, our special interest group, right? How will this benefit us, right? And I think the, the focus shouldn't be on what this would do to some particular group. It should be what's good for society, what's the common good, what's good for children, right? That's where the focus, what, you know, the, in other words, marriage is an institution that is, you know, age old, and it has certain function, functions, it seems to me, and those functions actually, and I think they, these all have to do with, with it, its relationship to having children and raising children. I, these are the things that entitle it to special treatment under the law. And, and I think that's where the focus should be on, on how, what is our understanding of marriage and, 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 and you know, why should this group qualify, I guess. Janelle Burke. I feel compelled before I ask my question just to make a couple of comments. Great. The first one being that judges don't make law in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Judges don't make law. They interpret law. Supposedly. And, yeah. and, <laughs> and they don't the decide in, in a vacuum. Right. Uh, they have precedent that they must follow and, mm -hmm. and so forth. And secondly, that the Constitution doesn't address a lot of things that mm -hmm. are uh, very factual matters of 21st century life, mm -hmm. uh, the way things are today. Mm -hmm. But my question has to do with a constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, in general, mm -hmm. family law has been a matter that has been left to the states. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, our family law, divorces, uh, sure. rights of children, child support, are matters for the most part of state law. 
But do you, uh, first of all, support a federal constitutional amendment regarding marriage? Very much so. And secondly, uh, if you don't support that, would you support an amendment for civil unions? Well, I do support the, fed the proposed federal marriage amendment, even though regulation of marriage has largely been a matter left up to the states. The reason I support the fe federal marriage amendment has to do with the fact that the other side that is basically, this is all a kind of defensive maneuver, right? It's not like we were sitting down and, and figuring out, now what can we do to just aggravate the gay lesbian community? Let's propose a defensive marriage act or let's propose a federal marriage amendment. These were clearly responses to this aggressive litigation posture of the gay lesbian advocacy organizations. That is, the Defense of Marriage Act that passed in the Congress in 1996, and now in over 40 of the 50 states, was a direct response to the Hawaii suit and the Vermont suit and the Massachusetts suit, right? That is, it was responsive to how do we protect our own state's understanding, age-old understanding of marriage? How do we best protect that? But now, states do that for themselves? Well, one would hope that they could, I guess I don't see it. And the reason I don't see it is let, w watch what's happening now in Massachusetts. The, the, the strategy from the other side has always been get one state as a beachhead and then use that state by, through, through applying the Article 4's full faith and credit clause to essentially require the export of same-sex marriage to every other state, okay? And so... So I guess what I'm saying is it's the other side that wants to federalize this issue, and the only way of defending against that is through a federal constitutional amendment. Unfortunately, in my view, I think it would be preferable if we had judges that could be relied upon for their good sense. Unfortunately, what I've seen happen, at least in Massachusetts, is judges who are all too quick to amend the Constitution under the pretext of interpreting the Constitution. So you're right that judges are not supposed to make law. They're supposed to interpret law. But what do we do with judges who are all too ready to make law and say they're just interpreting the Constitution, and they do it by a 4-3 to three vote, right? The only possible response, well, there are two, I suppose, constitutional responses. One is constitutional amendment. The other is impeachment. And I guess I'm saying, you know, just one practical illustration of the point I'm trying to make about why we need a federal marriage amendment if we are to preserve our traditional understanding of marriage in a place like Idaho, right, or Utah even. In Massachusetts, right now, the Gay Lesbian Advocates and Defenders have a lawsuit attacking the constitutionality under our state constitution of a 1913 law which basically says you can't, if you're a non-resident of Massachusetts and come here to get married, you can't get married here if you couldn't get married where you're from, okay? Now, they have challenged that law, and the only purpose of challenging that law is because once they get that law stricken as unconstitutional, then people will be able to flock to Massachusetts from, from Idaho, get married in Massachusetts, return home, and then promptly claim that Idaho has to recognize their same-sex marriage. So you, have, you will have Idaho same-sex marriage willy-nilly, regardless of what the Idaho Constitution says, regardless of what the Idaho law says, regardless of what the citizens of Idaho want. And so I'm saying the only way, really, of protecting of that, if you think, as I do, that marriage is what it's always been, is a federal marriage amendment. I'm sorry, it's just come to that. So the second part of that uh, question <laughs> being, I take it then that you would, you would agree that there could be some language in this amendment that would recognize civil unions so that people's rights uh, might be recognized. I, I guess uh, my, my sense of it is that the federal marriage amendment actually does not address st the state, states' abilities to legislatively enact marriage-like benefits for same-sex couples, right? So you'd leave that to the states, but I would leave. I, I guess I would leave that to the democratic process in the states. I'm not in favor of judges being able to enact civil unions. I'm against civil unions for the same reason I'm against same-sex marriage, which is it's not a marriage, it's not like a marriage, so therefore we shouldn't treat it like a marriage. So they shouldn't have the same rights. They shouldn't have the same rights. There may well be, in fact, I, I'm will, uh, perfectly willing to concede that there are some rights that they're perfectly entitled to, and by the way, they, th that they qualify for now. For example, the one thing you know, Praveen and others bring up quite often is hospital visitation rights. 
Now, I'm all for hospital visitation rights, but most states, I mean, I think every state, you can appoint somebody, your, pro you know, your proxy to make medical decisions, which would entitle them to visit you in the hospital. You don't have to get to, ma you don't have to marry somebody to be able to visit them in the hospital, okay? In other words, there are ways of accommodating what are legitimate interests and expectations without overturning our understanding of what marriage has always been. It's always so enjoyable to, to have a conversation <laughs> with... See a nut. <laughs> with, no, 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 no. With uh, professors of uh, law at universities, because it, it fascinates me I, in my years in constitutional law. And so based on that couple of things, one is, no matter what position we take in life, there is some, some other examples that kind of block our consistency. And, and here's my question sure. is, from time to time, the Supreme Court makes a decision five to four that you agree with. Right. And other times, of course, you disagree. So we're all like this. Only. When, they're, when you're in agreement with them, then it's okay that one judge really made well, the decision. I, I guess, yeah, I guess. <laughs> well, and it's not just the, when I agree with them. It's, it's when, when it's a fair, what, what is, I think, a fair implication of the Constitution. I don't s subscribe to this school of thought that basically makes our Supreme Court some kind of infallible oracle as to the meaning of the Constitution. I think they can and have been egregiously wrong throughout our history. For example... They were wrong in Dred Scott that virtually single-handedly brought on our civil war. They were wrong in making slavery a constitutional right. I think clearly they were wrong. I think they were wrong in Roe versus Wade, and I don't think I, I don't think it's set. That issue is settled now, and and so I guess I'm saying I th yes, I think the Supreme Court can get it wrong. They got it wrong in Plessy versus Ferguson in the 1890s. You know, it took Brown versus Board of Education to undo that. So I guess I, you know, I, I don't think we should have exaggerated deference to what the courts, some group of judges who, after all, are human like the rest of us, you know, have, have I, think about yeah, something. Yeah, you, you brought some real good examples. You know, the most egregious thing they ever decided was the uh, Dred Scott case. I, I yeah. agree. But I'm just, I'm having a little fun, too, to say it's a lot more fun when they're in your favor, five, four, well, than against course, it. Course, and, and, of yeah. course, then that one vote makes a lot of wisdom. And so, <laughs> but the other thing I'm going to get back to is the Equal Protection Clause, the 14th Amendment, mm -hmm. and, and the due process. And you indicated that you believe the 14th Amendment was um, adopted, uh, and, and certainly was after the Civil War, and it dealt with racial issues. Would you disagree with the times the U.S. Supreme Court has used the Equal Protection Clause in dealing with age or gender and so forth, should they not have been supportive when certain laws were passed to uh, attack those discriminations under the 14th Amendment? Would you restrict the 14th Amendment only to racial No, I wouldn't restrict it only to racial okay. classifications. But, but, for example, with respect to age classifications, age discrimination by government, the courts give no heightened review and no, no greater scrutiny to that kind of discrimination in law than they do to, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, just any kind of acceptable discrimination by law. So, so uh, discrimination on the basis of gender, the courts have said that's entitled to heightened scrutiny, the so-called intermediate standard, and racial is, of course, entitled to strict scrutiny, which is the highest mm -hmm. standard. I'm really glad you said that because, uh, uh, in relation to my next question, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that is, uh, and, and you're certainly a much greater expert than I, but it seems to me the court, when it enters these fields of dealing with issues of discrimination, they've often been charged, which they try to kind of avoid, is that they put some of these groups in what we call suspect class and some right. semi-suspect class and, and gay issues or classification. They're not up there at all, except no. a couple of cases. But right. uh, do you think that, that because the court does that and they gradually, and, and you've already made a statement on this, but certainly when they deal with racial questions, they're much more eager to deal with it than they are some other issues. Mm -hmm. But is that part of the evolution that they're slow and, and, and cautious about extending their decision-making to some areas that they may do so at a later time? And well, I, I think they're, my, my view is they're rightly cautious because, in effect, the only reason that they you know, are entitled to judicially review the constitutionality of legislation is because it violates some clear constitutional mandate. Uh, you know, if... For example, when the Massachusetts Constitution was ratified by the people in 1780, right, I think nobody at that time would have said or thought that this Constitution that we're passing requires the recognition of same-sex marriage. I think the idea would have struck everybody as completely insane. I mean, just, they wouldn't even, it wouldn't even have even registered with them. So I guess I, I, I do have a problem when then judges 225 years later say, aha, we've discovered that actually this was buried in there in the meaning and our evolving standards and all this kind of stuff. 
Because then what's happening, and I think Scalia is right on the money when it comes to this. I don't always agree with him, but on this point, I do agree with him. I think basically what you have then is just the raw judicial imposition of values by, by, by judges. Essentially, they think they know better than everybody else what's right and what's fair, and they're going to decide, right? It's another thing if you're dealing with an express constitutional provision like freedom of speech, where you can kind of clearly tease out the implications, right, for, for something like the flag-burning controversy. I think Scalia is right in saying states can't flag, ba ban flag-burning because it's a violation of free speech. I think he's correct about that, but I don't think, I, I, I guess, you know, it's a matter of what's a fair implication of the meaning. You know, there, there is a kind of, I, I think it's important, basically, that we not make of constitutional provisions some kind of living document, right, that evolves and changes according to, basically, the values and opinions of judges. Because then what we've done is taken the Constitution and have made it, under the, under the guise of making it a living document, have made it a dead letter. Right. <laughs> We're almost out of time. I want you to get the last uh, <laughs> point, not I, but this is fun, uh, and it's enjoyable uh, engaging in a dialogue with um, uh, a distinguished professor of law. Uh, if, and when, when we refer to founding fathers, and they had a lot of genius about them, but they also had little problems, to sure. say the least. If they were to come back alive today and they were to see the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause, they own slaves, most of them. Uh, shall we base all of our decisions based upon uh, some of the things they were thinking? In other words, wouldn't it be right. important to say that we can't go with them completely in all the kind of ideas they had. How would they look at the 14th Amendment? You see, they well, might. I agree, but the point is yeah. the 14th Amendment is a, an amendment to the yes. Constitution, so that's, it's the, basically the framers of the 14th Amendment and their understanding that would govern yes. the interpretation of the 14th Amendment. The point is there is no gay marriage amendment to any Constitution. They won't even propose it through legislatures because they don't want it to be put to a vote. They want to be able to have captive audiences we of judges. We asked that question last week, but the, the issue that's for us that's so fascinating is our debates on what is in the 14th Amendment and how you interpret it. Right. But I want to say that uh, on behalf of Janelle Burke and our staff, not only on the program, but for the whole time you're here, thank you so much oh, for being with you. us and it's engaging in this very challenging intellectual dialogue because it is really, really... It's a hot makes, topic. And it makes us all think, doesn't it? <laughs> I uh, hope so. <laughs> uh, it, it's so great for our students on critical thinking, analytical thinking. Several students have said to me, I went into the, the forum thinking one thing, I come out and I'm not sure what I think because both sides have been so effective in their presentation. Either thank that you. that or confusing. You know? <laughs> well, Professor Duncan, thank you so much for being with Thanks us. Thanks for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, we've had a wonderful time uh, bringing these programs to you. We'll continue next week with another subject under these hot topics. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest-running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station. Music